cool, cool. Hello guys, and welcome to the Special America edition of the Clef Western Civilization 2 Study Guide. Today I am wearing these swimming American flag socks that will be covered up by even sexier American flag pants. Crawling up my legs to my upper torso, I'm styling in a Make America Swole Again bro tank. And to top it all off, I'm wearing a Boston Red Sox cap because that's where most of this started. If you haven't already guessed, uh, today we are going to be talking about the American Revolution. And like every other time in history, we have to go back before the event for context. So the first thing is this thing called the French and Indian War, um, or the Seven Years War, whatever you prefer to call it. Just know it was fought between the British and the French, not the French and the Indians. Ended up in the British winning and claiming Canada, or sorry Canada. This is partially why Canada speaks a lot of English, and then there's parts that speak French. Anyway, after winning the war, the British ended up having to deal with three different groups. So in 1763, Britain actually made uh, some deals with some Native American tribes, basically saying that the colonists won't move past the Appalachian Mountains, giving the the Native Americans anywhere from the Mississippi to the Appalachians. I'm gonna leave a map up here so people who don't study it can actually know what I'm talking about. Obviously this pissed off the colonists. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to the Northeast. It sucks. I was born there. There's a reason I live in Colorado now because I wanted to move west of the Appalachians. No. So in 1774, uh, Parliament actually passed this thing called the Quebec Act which basically gave the French-speaking people in Canada some French beliefs, like they were allowed to hold their Roman Catholic beliefs and stuff like that. This pissed off the colonists because the colonists felt, you know what, why are we giving our conquered enemies some advantages here? This ain't fair. Now, the British colonists were incredibly diverse, and when I say diverse, make sure you understand that this is the 1770s version of diverse, not the modern version of diverse. It is not diversity of skin color, it is diversity of continent, okay? There's a lot of different people from a lot of different countries all over the United States. You had a lot of people from the Netherlands, people from Germany, from England, Ireland, Scotland, uh, France, even. There's also African slaves and stuff like that, but... Uh, they were they were not considered part of this diversity and because of this all of these different states had their own culture their own way of life um, And there's a huge divide between the north and the south in the south It was really big uh, for slave tobacco rice corn stuff like that Really popular in Europe because a lot of those things you couldn't have in Europe and in the north They had rum refined sugar and the biggest thing that they had was wood which they used to build ships, and because Britain um, is an island, it was actually a very naval army. So in addition to dealing with these three groups, there was a huge recession that came on after the war, which hurt everybody. During the war, the colonists were left mostly alone by Britain. They weren't really taxed that much. Things weren't that much of a problem. So then there's these things called the Navigation Acts, which basically made it hard for foreigners to get here. In addition to making it hard for foreigners to get here, they also had to have a bunch of stuff. So if you wanted to get tea from the Netherlands, you had to have it shipped through Britain. And most importantly with all of this is that during this time, taxes were extremely low or non-existent. But after the Seven Years' War, that wasn't the case. So Britain basically got really scared that the French were for some reason going to have an insurgency and attack again. So they basically sent a bunch of troops over to the United States, which cost money. They didn't know where to get that money from. They decided, oh, let's just tax the colonists and say, we're, we're having you pay for your protection. This would be kind of like in high school, the teacher passing out condoms and then asking you for 10 bucks because she passed out free condoms. So you have safe sex. Uh, this mostly came through in this thing called the Stamp Act in 1765, which basically means that every public document needed a stamp, which you had to pay for. To go even further with this, if you wanted to play cards, you had to get a stamp on the cards, on your deck of cards, to play cards. So this basically violated all the traditions of British rule up until this point, because if you remember back to the English Civil Wars video, they actually were supposed to give the people more right and say over their taxes. This really pissed off the colonists because they didn't feel they needed protection either, they just felt like, oh well, the French aren't doing anything, they're not very strong, they surrender over everything, which is true. And the biggest thing is that they felt that their rights were being violated. However, one of those things that a lot of people don't mention is that there's a lot of major cities in England at the time that actually did not have uh, representation in Parliament. So they were breaking rules on multiple levels. However, the colonists didn't even know that, so they didn't really care either, so they just ended up 
rioting and rebelling. This rioting and rebelling was encompassed in a group called the Sons of Liberty. Now, if you've ever heard the phrase, no taxation without representation, this was them. The biggest thing that they did is they fought against stamp offices and tax collectors. This ended up leading to about 2,000 New Yorkers rioting in New York right before the implementation of the law. Then they formed the Stamp Act Congress, basically urging citizens to refuse using stamps uh, so they didn't have to pay this tax anymore. And in 1766, Ben Franklin took a break from flying kites Let's go fly a kite. and decided to bring his qualms to Parliament in England. And Parliament then repealed the Stamp Act. I know. I know. However, during the same exact session, they actually passed another law saying that they had complete control over the American colonists. And in 1767, the Townsend Acts were then passed. What are the Townsend Acts, you might ask? It was basically a tax parliament used to tax basic necessities of life. Tea, glass, even, um, wood, anything that you would build with for the most part. Many colonists actually even bought tea from the Dutch, even though it was more expensive without the tax, just because I guess to prove a point. You see, we Americans don't care about the logic only if we are proving a point. You have five million subscribers, you say the n-word in your video, like that's not cool, kill yourself. It's every day bro with the Disney Channel flow. And a few years later, these issues ended up growing violent. Basically, a bunch of British soldiers fired upon five protesters um, in an event that would later became known as the Boston Massacre. If you go to the place today where it happened, it's really pathetic. It really, it really hurt me seeing it. It's, it's a little circle, probably no bigger than this, that just, it's the old street that was there and it said, oh, the Boston Massacre happened here. Now in the British defense and all of this, the the protesters were throwing snowballs at them. Well, with rocks, mate. Sorry, you're a man. Now, after this, Parliament felt like they needed to repeal all their taxes, so they did. Except the one on tea, which this was kept to basically show that Parliament still held power over the American people. Not for long, wankers. Hell yeah. If you couldn't tell by my stupid video, this eventually led to the Boston Tea Party. So the Boston Tea Party in 1773 was the group, the Sons of Liberty, with a bunch of other merchants. They decided to dress up as Native Americans and board a ship, throwing all of the tea overboard, costing a couple million of pounds uh, for the British. Just like I've been to the place where the Boston Massacre, I've been to the place where the Boston Tea Party let me tell you, Boston is not as cool as it used to be. <laughs> but the Tea Party actually made it worse because Parliament decided to implement the Coercive Acts of 1774. They closed the port to Boston, they basically didn't allow any Massachusetts people to get out, they, w they didn't want the spread of radical thinking. And they even moved a bunch of soldiers into the area and had them stay in random people's houses. This is where the seemingly pointless Third Amendment comes from, where a government can't force you to have soldiers stay in your house. Now, a big thing with this is that British officials were no longer to be tried in local courts. If you can guess what this does, what it basically ends up doing is that um, if a person feels that this person needs to be persecuted for what they did, uh, they no longer can be. It takes a huge advantage as to being a Brit, you can't be tried in that area. Now what this did is it brought on the first Continental Congress in 1774. It sent a list of qualms to King George III, which back in these days took six weeks to get there and then six weeks to get an answer back. To put in perspective for you, that's your entire summer break. Now your friend ignoring you for a day doesn't seem like that big of a deal, does it? And since it took so long to get there, now it's actually to the point where people started wanting to arm up and defend themselves. So they actually started defending themselves along the countryside so that these troops didn't see it in Boston. And on April 19th of 1775, British soldiers under the command of General Thomas Gage actually were supposed to secure a store of ammunition and weapons in Concord, Massachusetts. Then the colonists tried their first PR stunt. Faggot. I know. The colonists were warned by Paul Revere that the Redcoats are coming, and the famous riot of Paul Revere. There's actually another dude, apparently, too, but nobody talks about him. 
for some reason. And the colonists decided to fight back against the British trying to take their weapons. They started firing from behind bushes and trees, ended up killing about 250 British soldiers, and then the American Revolution began. Now, before I go into the actual war, I'm going to go into the, the advantages and disadvantages of both sides. Now, if you actually remember back to the English Civil Wars episode, you remember one of the biggest disadvantages with them is this thing called militia armies. Don't worry, I'll explain it again real quick. So what a militia army is, is it's basically they only want to fight for their area. So if I'm part of Boston, I'm not going to be urged to go and fight in New York. I don't really care about fighting in New York because I don't like the Yankees. Actually, that's not the reason why. It's because you want to protect your home and you don't really care about anybody else and there's no reason for you to go fight anywhere else. So you stay in your area. What this ultimately ends up doing is you make small armies everywhere as opposed to a large army. And it's easier to take out small armies with a big army and then just keep wiping them out all the way through. Now, on the other hand, the British had a huge advantage in this whole war. They had a 9 million citizen population. They had one of the strongest naval armies in the entire world. They were right next to Europe, so they have extremely easy trade with them. But just you wait, England. Oh, just you wait. Now, the biggest British disadvantage in this entire thing is the distance. Like I said before, it's about a six week boat ride to there and back. So if you want any information of whether you lost a battle, what lands you have, it is not only six weeks delayed, so so much has happened in that time period, you have to send new troops and you don't know exactly where you should send them. So it's gonna take another six weeks to even get those troops there. And another huge part of this is that the soldiers didn't care as much because they're not fighting for their own land, they're not fighting for their own country, they don't feel like they're fighting for anything. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions with this entire war is the fact that the British colonists wanted to break away from England in the start. That was not the case. They just wanted their liberties protected how they were supposed to be after the English Civil Wars and the Glorious Revolution. This didn't work out for them in that way exactly. Because in the Glorious Revolution, it ended up saying that they they needed representation to have taxation upon themselves. In 1768, when the British actually landed in Boston, the Bostonians reacted similarly to the parliamentarians did during the English Civil Wars, where without having a standing army in the time of peace is actually against the rules of the English Constitution. Now, something to keep in mind for this for Americans too, a lot of Americans think we actually influence Europe to keep going after this. It's not the case because of the style of revolution that happened in France and the style of revolution that happened in the United States. The United States uh, Revolution was an enlightenment revolution where we believed in the value of the individual and the individual rights. While in France, in the French Revolution, which inspired more of the modern day Europe, they were more for a groupthink approach that the poor are being out manned by the, the wealthier who have more money. Now the war began. Now the colonies actually started off with uh, a lot of losses, but some glimmers of hope here and there. The British broke the colonial siege at Boston and ended up getting Boston out of the whole process. And there is actually a bunch of stores of weapons on Bunker Hill uh, near Boston. And the colonists actually ended up killing tons of British people off, which actually ended up helping them a ton. They ended up losing, but they still killed a tons of Brits off. This led to the Second Continental Congress being convened, where they actually came together to organize the war effort and create a 25,000 person military with George Washington as their leader. They were also completely terribly supplied. They had no cannons, they had no winter clothes. It was pretty miserable for them. And like before, the militiamen that felt that they were too far away from home often bailed and just went home instead. And Britain actually started to begin recruiting Irish, Scots, and uh, Hessians or Germans, but it's just Germans from this weird little region in the center of Germany. Then the American army decided to start fighting towards Quebec to get the French Canadians on their side. However, the colonists were subdued by the British. And then in March of 1776, Washington decided to put uh, cannons all around Boston on the hillsides near it just as a threat ended up making the British evacuate. Then Washington then moved his troops down into New York City. And in July 4th, of 1776, one of the most superb documents to ever be signed was signed, the Declaration of Independence. America, America, America. It 
was a document that was created to tell Britain that they are no longer British now. They are members of the United States of America. Now, actually, let's go back into the war. During the same month that Washington moved his troops into New York City, uh, he had, ended up having to split them between the islands of Manhattan and Long Island, um, where the British were able to then flank or go around the back of uh, Washington's army in Long Island, making it impossible for him to leave and then having to evacuate into New Jersey. However, the British General Howe didn't actually decide to follow him for some reason. Then the Continental Congress actually fled into Philadelphia to be able to uh, protect themselves better from the nearby British army. However, typical Brit Howe decided to spread his forces thinly across New Jersey. And after a hard winter, George Washington decided to lead his troops uh, across the Delaware on Christmas night in 1776 uh, to the Battle of Trenton, where they defeated a ton of Hessian, or again, German uh, mercenaries. And after a few more victories, General Howe then left New Jersey for George Washington's control. 1777 was actually one of the most crucial years of the war. The British Army under General Burgoyne actually came down from Canada trying to cut the colonies in two and make them separated from each other. He was a man way ahead of his time. Uh, and Burgoyne actually asked Howe to take the Americans down at Saratoga to help him surround it and make the battle easier for him. But Howe, being the typical dumbass that he was, decided to go down to Philadelphia and take that instead. And in the process of which, ended up making Burgoyne lose Saratoga. And because Howe pushed into Philadelphia, George Washington had to flee into Valley Forge, where uh, about 2,000 men died of being cold. And because uh, the Americans actually won Saratoga, though, against Burgoyne, the French actually were able to uh, join into the American Revolution because they felt they had a chance. Additionally to this, Hal actually ended up retiring or sending in his resignation. Uh, something that was weird that Britain also tried to do during this time is they sent word to them saying uh, that if we stop fighting, we'll just go back to a tax-free nation. Um, but at this point, it was well past the way. Too many people had died to give it up. So then General Hillary Clinton, um, oops, I mean, uh, Henry Clinton took over for Howe and decided to march his troops to New York. Along the way, the British actually started arming natives and loyalists to the British cause to fight back against them. And in return, George Washington burnt a bunch of Iroquois crops as a threat of don't mess with us. God damn it, George. Uh, the Spanish also decided to join into the war at this point, which pushed the British completely off the North American continent, which led to the war in the North eventually just coming to a tie, or just a stalemate. And the British then went south as to hopes of conquering some land and then working their way up. And down there, the British actually tried arming a bunch of slaves to actually uh, fight back, and they promised them their freedom if they fought back. Sorry, guys. And they ended up taking Charleston, South Carolina, um, in 1780, where Clinton ended up defeating most of the Southern Colonial Army. Clinton then decided to go back to New York, leaving General Cornwallis in charge of the Southern Army, which was a big mistake. Then there was an American named Horatio Gates who decided to actually go in and fight off against Cornwallis. He ended up losing, which gave Cornwallis all of South Carolina and Georgia. Then Cornwallis started to get greedy and he marched right into North Carolina to try and take that. Now, uh, he was actually stopped there by a band by the name of Nathaniel Green. Then Cornwallis had to flee into a town in North Carolina called Wilmington. Because he fled his army into there, he lost the entirety of both Georgia and South Carolina. Cornwallis tried to escape and ended up trying to go to Yorktown in Virginia, where the French actually uh, closed his port, they blockaded his port, and then George Washington came in by land and surrounded him on the land side. Which led to the surrender of General Cornwallis and the British Army on October 13th of 1781. Hell yeah. However, the king actually got news of this again six weeks later and decided to keep fighting. And then in 1782, uh, the British prime minister actually ended up resigning and he was pro the war. And then the new prime minister who came in was against the war. Uh, so the war ended up ending uh, right then and there. And then in 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed and the war was officially over. Just so you guys know, after the war ended, it did not actually do that much damage to Britain. It did a little bit to their uh, trade and their crops, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, they were still a superpower afterwards. They still had a lot of the world over, um, and that's why they were able to invade again in 1812. And as I said before, the French uh, got inspired from the Americans to have a revolution. They saw it could be done to fight off the king. 
Uh, however, the massive amount of debt from the war for the French and the Seven Years' War just before this uh, made it even worse for the king. Um, so the people were very pissed because they were having extremely high levels of taxation. But as I explained before, you have the two different ideals. You have the Enlightenment ideals of the Americans and you have the French Revolution ideals, which led to this group thing mob mentality that happened in the French Revolution. And then the rest of Europe kind of branched off and formed their own versions of that. That's part of the big reason why there's a big difference between Americans today and Europeans. Um, we have a lot of Western culture shared values like that, but when it comes to health care and abortion and guns and different issues like that, we have a lot of differences. America then formed the Constitutional Convention in 1787, creating the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Um, and through that time, they actually ended up wanting to make George Washington the king, but George Washington refused and said he'll be the president instead. Uh, and he became the first president of the United States in 1789. Now, the beauty of this is America created itself from John Locke's position of government, that the individual governs themselves. The individual has more rights than the government. Doing so to protect their life, liberty, and property. This was completely encompassed in the U.S. Constitution, where God didn't have control over the people, the government didn't have control over the people, the king didn't. What it was now was the people had control over themselves and the government. Thank you all for watching this Western Civilization II CLEP study guide uh, for this episode. If you like this video, I would urge you to hit that like button down there. Helps me out, makes me more interesting. If you also think this content's kind of interesting, please subscribe. I, I try to make videos as often as I can. Uh, I also don't make a lot of money from this, so... Uh, until I do, I'm not going to be actually doing a ton of videos, but the more subscribers I have, the more videos I'm going to make because it makes me more income. So start subscribing. Also, I, I don't mention this a lot of times, but there actually is this quiz in the description. So if you are interested, go ahead and do that. Just fill out in the comments section, whatever makes you happy. Uh, just help you practice with how well you know this information. Thanks guys. See you later.